Listen for a word from God in Mark chapter 3. Again, he entered the synagogue, and a man was there who had a withered hand. They watched him to see whether he would cure him on the Sabbath so they, that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, come forward. Then he said to them, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. He looked around them with anger. He was grieved at their hardness of heart and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him, how to destroy him. My husband first asked me on a date after seeing my profile on Adventist Singles. We had met before and lived only four miles apart, but my profile was what let him know that I was available and ready for a relationship. Yes, we are one of the couples who has to give some credit to online dating. If you met or reconnected online, I would love to hear from you in the comments wherever you're watching. Please share the name of your partner and how long you've been together. I'm going to write, my husband's name is Mike, and our five-year anniversary is on May 1. But we never would have gotten together if he hadn't take an action. Mike tells me that he had been on the dating sites looking around for years and besides a few exceptions had only started really reaching out to people months before that first date invitation. He'd read a book called How to Get a Date Worth Keeping by Henry Cloud. Cloud encouraged him to stop scrolling and start dating. Scrolling had been depressing, a negative experience, though I'm glad for my sake that he didn't read the book sooner and land up with someone else. I'm grateful he stopped the scroll on me. The person who claims to have invented endless scrolling wishes he could stop the scroll. Azar Raskin, now 37, claims to have come up with the concept in 2006. Scrolling is how Google serves us search results. Why YouTube rolls the next video without us asking for it. And how our social media accounts offer endless posts or stories. Raskin estimates that his endless scrolling, his infinite scroll, wastes about 200,000 human lifetimes every day. So should we all delete our accounts and our apps? Well, all of us right now are watching this worship service on Facebook, YouTube, or the church website, all of which involve scrolling. I'd like to suggest that the issue here is not scrolling, but mindless, endless, passive scrolling. Researchers are starting to distinguish between active and passive social media use. In 2015, a study at the University of Michigan found that using Facebook passively led to declines in well-being. Passive users, those who scrolled but did not comment or post themselves, felt a lot worse at the end of each day. In 2020, Harvard School of Public Health released a study that showed when people use social media as part of their daily routine and respond to content, they have greater social well-being and positive mental health. The problems came when users checked excessively or kept scrolling through content without responding. Our Facebook campus is open today. And I hope it's a place where you stop the scroll. We're not asking you to join another group so we can blast you with more information. We are truly wanting to invite you from our front porch into our living room so we can have more meaningful conversations together. I hope you'll go to facebook.com slash LSU Church, click groups, and join. 
And then I hope you post something that has been life giving or stress reducing lately a picture, a text, a verse, something funny. I can't wait to see what has been life giving for you or what has been reducing your stress during these crazy times. In the scroll is not only a 21st century problem, though. In Mark chapter 3, Jesus enters the synagogue and finds it there too. In verse 2, Mark says, they watched him. This story is the climax in a series of five stories in which Jesus conflicts with the leaders of his day. In chapter two, Jesus forgives a paralytic and they charge him with blasphemy. Then he calls a tax collector to be his disciple and hangs out with all his friends and the religious leaders charge him with keeping the wrong company. Then they notice that Jesus' uh, disciples aren't fasting. And in the fourth encounter, they find the Jesus' disciples picking and eating grain on Sabbath, which they have defined to be work, even if it's just a little bit while you're walking along. They're watching Jesus now and trying to catch him in further violations. And Jesus, on his part, doesn't shy away from the conflict. He calls a man with a disability to the front. This is intentional, purposeful. The man wasn't waiting in line to be healed. He didn't ask Jesus to be healed. He was minding his own business, attending church. Jesus is clearly making a point. He asks his opponents a question. Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath? To save life or to kill? They're silent, not a peep. You could have heard a pin drop, no comment. But Jesus, where is the middle ground here? These are such stark contrasts. Would would not doing good in this situation really do harm? Is there not a neutral? Does someone's life really need to be saved? No one is dying here, Jesus. If they were, the religious leaders would have agreed They needed help. The man's hand was withered and had been for a long time. It wasn't life-threatening, or was it? The leaders are silent. They don't answer Jesus' question, and Jesus is livid. Why is Jesus so angry? What's the big deal? Surely this man could wait till the next day to be healed. It's easy at this point for us to think negatively about the Pharisees and forget that they were highly respected lay members who really cared about being wholly devoted to God. Pharisees meant the separated ones, and they they wanted to safeguard themselves and others from becoming impure and immoral. But a focus on purity makes you look at people as potential polluters. A focus on purity makes you look at other people as potential polluters. They were so focused on all the ways they could go wrong that they missed what needed to be made right. They missed the man with the withered hand. He may not have been dying, but he was in a desperate situation. Christian tradition says this man used to be a mason and lost his livelihood due to this ailment. He needed to be saved from poverty. And there is more at stake here than this one individual. Jesus is using language that echoes with significance. This good or evil, life or death formula would have reminded his opponents, his opponents who likely as part of their training would have memorized the first five books of the Hebrew Bible of the covenant between God and Israel. He was reminding his opponents of some language they would have known very well. Quoting from Deuteronomy 30, verse 15, and then verse 19. Moses had said, See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death, and adversity. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life 
and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live. One verse before this, in Deuteronomy 30, verse 14, in the Septuagint, this is a Greek translation of the Septuagint, which is, uh, sorry, this is an English translation of the Septuagint, which is a Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, and I read in English, the word is very near thee in thy mouth and in thine heart and in thy hands to do it. The word is near you in your mouth, in your heart, in your hands. Jesus alludes to this contrast between the covenant in Deuteronomy and the situation in front of him in the synagogue. The word is in your mouth, yet you're silent. It's in your heart, but your hearts are hardened. It's in your hands to do it, but you refuse. You are the ones with the withered hands. Jesus, full of anger and grief, says to the man in front of him, stretch out your hand. In those words to the man, the Deuteronomy scholars may have heard echoes of another passage from the law. Every seventh year was a sabbatical. It was a Sabbath year. It was for debt forgiveness between Hebrews. This was meant to prevent the cycle of perpetual debt and slavery, debt and slavery. It would have been natural, though, not to want to lend to someone who may not be able to pay it back, especially right before the seventh year, knowing you would likely lose your investment. But Deuteronomy 15, verse 11, talking about this very situation of refusing to lend to someone just before the seventh year, says this, since there will, be never, that since there will never cease to be some in need on the earth, I therefore command you, open your hand to the poor and needy neighbor in your land. Moses says, stretch out your hand. Jesus is angry and grieved, not just because of their lack of concern for this poor man, but for their lack of active Sabbath keeping, their lack of doing good. Not only has this man's livelihood been lost, but the Pharisees' life-giving ministry, their hands are withered and they don't even know it. Their learning, education, dedication in this story is furthering the cause of death and not life. They're set too sure about themselves and their positions. Jesus, mad and sad, says, stretch out your hand. And again, this language is straight from the sacred scrolls. And this time we're in Exodus. Last Sabbath, Pastor Bev shared how Israel had been slaves to Pharaoh who demanded endless production. She said the abuse of that system became normal and they longed for that normality even if it was slowly killing them. It's like they were incapable of turning off the daily grind switch. Jesus reminds his people that they have been freed from Egypt. These words, stretch out your hand, are the same words God tells Moses in Exodus 14, 16, when God's people are trapped between the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army. But you lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the Israelites may go into the sea on dry ground. Moses, stretch out your hand so Israel can be free of Pharaoh. Israel, Stretch out your hand to the poor so they can be free. Man in the synagogue, stretch out your hand and be healed. And this is what Sabbath is for. The man stretched out his hand and it was restored. Jesus gave life on the Sabbath and the Pharisees left the synagogue that day determined to kill him. How is it that people can leave church determined to kill? On Tuesday night, our country was horrified at the news of shootings at three spas in and around Atlanta, Georgia. Six of the eight killed were Asian women. We were reminded that there have been 3,800 acts of hatred against Asian Americans this last year. Our hearts are with you this morning, as well as with these grieving families. The 21-year-old shooter was active and visible along with the rest of his family at the Crab Apple First Baptist Church. His former youth pastor said he would stack chairs and clean floors, and his father was a local leader. 
They attended on Sunday morning and Sunday night and came back on Wednesday night and went on mission trips. He told investigators that he had a sexual addiction and was, quote, eliminating temptation. His concern for a twisted notion of, quote, unquote, purity, whether sexual, racial, or some of both, led him to kill. We may not leave church determined to kill, but we too can harm hearts and lives by refusing to stretch out our hands. I was struck by the story of a receipt that went viral several years ago of a pastor in St. Louis who was eating out with a large group and instead of simply paying the automatically added tip, wrote, quote, I give God 10%. Why do you get 18? Another waiter at the restaurant saw the receipt, took a photo, and posted it to Reddit with the comment, My mistake, sir. I'm sure Jesus will pay for my rent and groceries. She neglected to block the pastor's name and information, which was a breach of privacy, and was fired. The waitress posted that she makes $3.50 an hour before tips and less than $9 an hour on average after tips and taxes. Quote, I come home exhausted, sore, burnt, dirty, and blistered on a good day. And after that, I can be fired for embarrassing someone who directly insults their server on religious grounds. The pastor apologized, but the waitress still lost her job. The damage was done. Here in the story, a pastor in Tennessee invited waiters to share, quote, how they get treated when the church crowd comes in on a website he called Sundays Are the Worst. Waiters shared stories of feeling insulted, evangelized, and looked down on. Growing up, I was taught not to spend money at all on Saturday, on the Sabbath. If it required the transfer of dollars, it was not to be done. Spending money required someone to work, and therefore I would be paying for them to break the commandment. This reason made less sense to me when I went to college and lived in the dorm. There didn't seem to be a big difference between going to the cafeteria to eat and going anywhere else. Either way, money was transferred on a card and someone was working. But... If Sabbath is about doing good and saving lives, it makes sense that I would be intentional about how I use money on that day, or why I don't, and what message I'm sending about the economy and how we treat workers. If I'm paying attention to doing good on Sabbath, I'll hesitate to quickly check out the items in my cart, thinking about who is impacted on the other end. I'll pay attention not only to what bills I'm not paying, but to the status of bills, like the Raise the Wage Act of 2021 that is attempting to increase the federal minimum wage from $7.25 to $15 an hour by 2025, which would raise the wages of one in three black workers, one in four Hispanic workers, and one in five white workers. And if I do go to a restaurant, I'll be sure to gift a generous tip and treat my waiter like a fellow human being made in God's image. My granny likes to tell the story of how her evangelist pastor and mother went to the grocery store one Sabbath to help a poor family. Their willingness to do good on the Sabbath made a lasting impression that she still recites nine decades later. Jesus frames his question not between doing or not doing on Sabbath, but between doing good and doing evil, saving life or killing. There is no such thing as not doing. Even our silence is doing something. Sabbath is not for the passive, endless scroll. Sabbath is for mindful action. Now that action could be play, like Bev shared last week, or rest, like Devo shared the week before. Mindful action could look like taking a nap because rested people are more generous people. It could also look like spreading out our hands to do good and save lives. We can practice on Sabbath mindful actions that point to Jesus the Lord of the Sabbath, the one who said that Sabbath was made for humanity and not the other way around. Sabbath is a day for receiving healing and bringing healing to others. Instead of asking, what are the rules and what do people think I should do or not do? What if we practiced asking, who needs to be helped today? How will my actions today contribute to healing? for myself, and for all humanity.
wherever you're watching right now, I invite you to stretch out your hand. You can do it literally like I am right now or between you and God in your heart. I invite you to stretch out your hand and pray with me, Lord Jesus. Our prayer is that we may be healed, that our hands would not be withered, that we would learn to join you in doing good. You are the Lord of the Sabbath, and the Sabbath is an opportunity to make you Lord in all that we do. May we bring life and not death. May you share your healing through us on this Sabbath and each day. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen.